Ladies and gents, evening all. Simon Brown here from Just One Lap. This evening, uh, we are. I'm joined with uh, Mike Brown from ETFSA, where I think most of us know Mike from these days, obviously, uh, is, is ETFSA. But he's actually the gentleman who launched the first uh, ETF in South Africa. Uh, next Friday will be exactly 20 years since it listed on the exchange. So Mike has agreed kindly to join us this evening. Uh, and a disclaimer, uh, Mike is sitting at an airport in, in, in Durban. So there's a little bit of background noise, but uh, nothing too bad and certainly nothing that, that that's going to uh, badly damage the presentation. Mike, evening. Uh, really appreciate your time today. Oh, thanks for the invite. It's a great pleasure to talk about 20 years of uh, the ETF industry, and uh, thanks for the invitation. I, I want to go back. I mean, before we come to Satrix and the like, a, a little bit. I mean, you, you were you you worked at the Chamber of Mines in the 70s and 80s, where of course you know mining South Africa was. I mean, the exchange was an absolute. Uh, it, it it was a mining exchange, uh, predominantly gold, and and you were back then in the thick of it as at, at Chamber of Mines. Um, I did. I was the chief economist of the Chamber of Mines. Uh, that was a long, long time ago. We used to run an intelligence service trying to predict the price of gold, which was uh, we spent a hell of a lot of money in the mining industry doing that and found that uh, we weren't much better at it than anybody else. But that was a lot of fun. And, I, uh, and that got me into the investment industry because we uh, we established quite a big investment uh, department in the Chamber to sell Kruger Rands and the proceeds of Kruger Rands. And, uh, mm -hmm. We actually got the foreign exchange market going in South Africa. In the old days, you had to sell any foreign exchange, had to go to the Reserve Bank, and the Chamber of Mines was the first company that broke that monopoly. So it was a nice background. Uh, but then I got into investment banking, and uh, when I was with Gensec Bank, we uh, we started looking at ETFs, which had just been started in uh, Canada and America, and said, why don't we do one of these in South Africa? And that's where, uh, that's where Satrix came from. Because we weren't, I mean, if John Bogle started, there were index unit trusts or mutual funds, and that was back in the 70s. The first ETFs in, in the US were, were early 90s. Um, so by the late 90s, when, when you were looking at them already, there was a sense of you could see the, the attraction. They were still relatively small, but certainly I imagine you know, from Johannesburg, you were looking out across to New York and thinking, there's something here, there's something worth pursuing. Very much so. Uh, we uh, there was the Spiders, which was the S and P 500 tracker fund in America, and we uh, we basically got all of the Spiders listing documents, uh, tailored them, and uh, took them to the JSC and let's said let's do one of these in South Africa. Now that was easier said than done because uh, in South Africa nobody had listed a fund, you know, portfolio shares, nobody had listed an open-ended share. You know, if you want to raise capital, you have to write, have a rights issue, which gets means you have to get permission from shareholders and so on. But uh, we had to make these things open-ended so you could raise or redeem capital every day. We had to make sure this uh, ETF tracked the index almost 100%. So we made it physical delivery so you could deliver physical baskets of shares and, and be uh, given uh, Satrix 40 shares in return and so on. So it was a very, very different product. To anything that was on the JSC at that stage. And what helped with Satrix is uh, when we went to chat to the JSC, they said, well, we've been thinking of this for a while. We don't know quite what to do, but can we come in and uh, partner you on this? And uh, it was very useful having the JSC, who were the listing authority, as part of the management team. So uh, that got things going, but it was a very innovative product in South Africa at its time. Yeah, and, and very complex, but uh, we tried to make it as simple as possible when we explained it to investors. I, I, I remember, and it was probably, I think it was maybe early December of 2000, a, a friend of mine, he, he, was, he, he was German, but he lived in Hong Kong. Um, and I was somehow, I don't know, I mentioned it to him. Um, but I didn't, truthfully, I had no idea what an ETF was. Um, and he said to me, they're the best thing ever. You should buy yourself some. So I, I think I, if memory serves, I try to go find my, my, my documents, but they don't go back 20 years. Um, I probably bought maybe December, maybe it was January, February. It was around about that time. But I hadn't thought of the, the challenges. You're right, because 
you know, pre ETFs, it, it was simple. You you issued a share, you had your IPO, um, and, and that was pretty much it. There, there, there was we had some market makers in the derivative space. I'm thinking particularly warrants and the like. Um, but that open end open ended nature of an ETF, where you're constantly creating new units, or as as case may be, uh, uh, you partially delisting some units, would have required, I imagine, changing in 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 uh, regulations and rules at the exchange. Well, massive uh, changes, and uh, uh, we even appointed market makers because the index, the 40 shares that were in the Satrix 40 basket, Satrix physically held those shares, held those baskets of shares. So the physical backing, every every Satrix 40 ETF and issue was physically backed by an underlying basket of mm -hmm. uh, index tracking mm -hmm. shares. But even then, you could have supply and demand could, could lead to the share price going above or below the value or the net asset value of the uh, of the ETF. So we then had to have physical delivery. You could swap your basket of shares for the ETF or vice versa. And we had to bring a market making set up in. Now, you couldn't market make in those days because that was called front running or insider trading <laughs> in the share market. But in ETFs, you were, you were allowed to point a market maker. And he was there to make sure this thing always traded at NAV. Um, because it really was an investment trust. It was an underlying basket of shares held in the trust. Now, in those days, investment trusts traded at discounts of 30, 40% to NAV, as they do today. <laughs> Even Rembrandt's trading at a massive discount to NAV. Yet an yeah. ETF always trades exactly at NAV. And setting that structure in place, we don't want to bore people with the complexities of it, but it's a, uh, uh, anybody who couldn't sleep at night and uh, picked up the Satrix listing documents, all 200 pages of it, and tried to understand that would pretty soon fall fast asleep. But, uh, yeah. So we try to explain it to a man in the street as a simple product. You buy one share and you own 40 shares. So you're basically buying a box of chocolates with 40 different chocolates in it and every one's a bit different and you own a little bit of every one of those 40 companies with the convenience of buying one share. And so we promoted Satrix, a lot of TV advertising and so on at the time as, as a way of owning the market. And Satrix was a name which was South African index trackers, South African index trackers, own the market, it, it went down quite quite well. And uh, we had an IPO uh, in uh, November 2000, and that yeah. raised 2.75 billion rand, which is one of the biggest IPOs wow. on record at that stage. But what was more critical was that it had massive numbers of people came in and bought Satrix who'd never owned a share in their life. Didn't have a stockbroking account, didn't have anything. So it created a lot of challenges as well. How did you get them onto the JSC? register and that sort of stuff so it was a it was a good success in its own way and it was it was quite fun and i uh, and i think it's uh it established the industry, which has been growing pretty steadily ever since. That's massive, because I was going to say, you know, how, how big was, you know, how was the, the launch of it? Uh, you know, 2.7 billion. I mean, and that, of course, is in 2000 rand, you know, day, day rand, not 2020 rand. Um, in, in other words, it, it, it really was a success pretty much from day one. Very much so. Yeah, very much so. It, 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 uh, I think it surprised everybody, including the JSC and the... Uh, and to some extent, Jensic Bank, and but some of them helped us out of it. Some of them put quite a lot of capital into it. So, mm -hmm. you no, know, I remember going talking to the Sunlam board, and I thought these guys are active managers. They're a bunch of old wormies. There's no way they're going to support something like this. And after a while, they said, "Okay, Mike, we'll, we'll, we'll help you out a bit," and they did. They put quite a lot of money into uh, Satrix and got it going. And some of them are still involved today. Some of them own Satrix nowadays, and they're. Uh, I mean, an important part of the uh, success story of uh, not only Satrix but uh, ETFs in general. Yeah, because back then in 2000, if it, it was Gensec, it was JC, it was Sunlum. They were the the three partners, um, and 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 over time, and now it, it's Sunlum who now has 100% of the the Satrix. Yes, it, uh, when we first got in, there was another small investment bank called Capital, which had come along at the same time with the idea. So we used Corp Capital. Um, Sunlum was a minority shareholder in Gensec Bank at the time, but eventually bought Gensec Bank out. Mm -hmm. And then Sunlum uh, eventually took over, you know, because the JSC was a shareholder in Satrix as well. And the JSC sold its shares in Satrix, you know, uh, in the market. Uh, I tried to buy them. I thought, well, I can own Satrix. But no, they, they said, no, we wanted somebody of substance, uh, <laughs> a little, uh, you know, investor like Brown owning this thing, which was a pity because it would have been quite fun to do that. Uh, uh, because at that stage, you could buy it for a couple of million rand. Well, yeah. I suppose yeah, yeah. I could have found it from somewhere. Anyway, anyway so that was the that was the situation. Uh, it's uh, now we've got an industry with more than 100 uh, ETFs listed, mm -hmm. and it's over 100 billion rand. 
mm. from that 2.7 billion that it started. And virtually what happened with the industry, it doubled every four years up until 2014. And since 2014, it's stabilized. It hasn't been growing at the same rate, but the number of ETFs in issue have been growing very substantially. So there's lots of ETFs around that just haven't attracted the sort of capital that the original ETFs did. And uh, yeah. But I think that's laying the path for the next uh, growth in the next uh, number of years uh, going forward, that there are a number of ETFs around. There's different participants in the industry. It's not just Satrix, it's other people. And uh, they're pretty well known. Yeah. You know, if you really ask somebody about ETFs, so they, they sort of say, well, yeah, we've heard Simon Brown you know, talking about them. We've got a pretty good idea what they are. Yeah, and I, I take your point. I mean, there was a lot of growth. I mean, initially it was Satrix 40, and then Satrix released the sort of the sub indices, the the Resi, the Finney, uh, uh, and the Indy. Where, where, when were those brought to market? Uh, well, this, the Finney and the Indy were listed in 2002. So Satrix okay. was 2000, 2002, and then they listed the Swix and the Resi and the others. So Satrix dominated all the South African indices, and nobody mm. else has been able to come in and really launched products on the big South African industry. Satrix dominated that. Uh, but what changed was that New Gold um, yeah. was listed in 2004, and that was ABSA. So ABSA Capital came along and said, we, we're going to list a gold bullion ETF. Satrix has said we want to do that as well, but the JSC said we can't just have one company dominating the market. So let's bring ABSA in to do, to do New Gold. And New Gold actually meant that you could buy a physical bullion, because uh, New Gold is 100% backed by a physical bar, gold bars, right from the start and still is today and uh, that was a very big change because South Africans aren't allowed to own bullion yeah but if you buy new gold and the other ETFs uh, that's the way to, to get hold of this particular asset class and the real growth in the industry from 2008 to about 2014 came from commodity ETFs that was really where the growth took place you know uh, new gold grew to about a 20 billion rand fund and they listed uh, new plaques in I think in 2013 a new uh, platinum, uh, I think, raised 13 billion rand in one year, which was the biggest capital raising, yeah. not in, more in one go, but raised it over a year. I think it was the biggest capital raising for a long time. Yeah, platinum was quite popular at that point in time, and uh, it's coming back into fashion now. So ABSA was a big factor in bringing these commodity uh, uh, ETFs to the market, and I think that broadened the market substantially. And, uh, and uh, you know, if you want to own commodities as an asset class, um, you mentioned mining shares used to dominate the JSC. Well, there's hardly any mining shares left in South Africa anymore. So if you want exposure to resources, buying a commodity ETF is probably your best option. Yeah, and certainly we've seen a, a lot of uh, sort of in the, in the ETN space as well. I know Standard Bank have got the ETNs, they've got uh, wheat, they've got oil, they've, they've got a whole bunch of sort of the more exotics down at that place. Yeah. Around 2008 as well, that, that Deutsche Bank came to market with some some offshore. They had, I think, was it Japan, uh, Europe, UK, the USA, and a, a, a global ETF. Was it there or was my memory wrong on date? Because I remember they came to market and then there was no sort of advancement in the offshore ETF until around 2014 or so? Well, Deutsche Bank actually came to the market in 2005 with uh, the FTSE and the Euro. Oh, was it early as that? The DBX, Euro Stock 50. And then in 2007 or 2008, they then bought in the World Fund, the USA Fund and the Japan Fund. Now, Deutsche was in quite an interesting space because they were big foreign exchange traders. And they... Uh, they knew the Reserve Bank world. In fact, most of the foreign exchange traders at Deutsche were ex-Reserve Bank people, and they went to the Reserve Bank, and they got umbrella allowance to be able to buy offshore ETFs and bring them into South Africa effectively as feeder funds, and to do that where individuals can then just buy these ETFs and RANDs, and Deutsche Bank would take care of the foreign exchange side of things. Mm -hmm. and they had a monopoly in that for some time until 2015, when the foreign exchange control uh, regulations were relaxed to say you could do inward listings, inward investments in South Africa. So you could list an offshore share or an offshore ETF on the JSC, get umbrella approval to do that from a foreign exchange point of view, and then local investors, you know, private individuals, companies, corporate and so on, could then buy that ETF effectively in rents. But the underlying asset that was being tracked by those ETFs was, was foreign assets. And the big growth from 2014 onwards, you know, once that, that concession was brought in in 2015, the exchange control relaxation has been in foreign reference ETFs. So uh, there were only about half a dozen of those before 2015. Now there, I think there's 38 yeah. foreign reference ETFs on the JSC. And this is probably going to be the big area of growth 
going forward, particularly because uh, last month they further relaxed exchange control restrictions to say that inward listings, ETFs, and even ETNs with the debt instruments are now regarded as domestic assets, and institutions can invest in those domestic assets and regard them as domestic. Uh, the FSCA has turned around and said, no, we need to think about this a bit more, whether we prepared to allow that or not, because the South African Reserve Bank and the FSCA aren't the same uh, regulator. Yeah. But I think that's opening up for the foreign exchange control uh, regulations is going to drive the next wave of ETF growth, which, which will just be listing foreign products on the JSC. At the moment in rands, I would expect that to turn into dollars in, in due course. That, uh, so I think the next area of growth in uh, ETFs will be in foreign reference products, but Deutsche set the thing in motion way back in 2005. So, uh, so in the early stages, we we had uh, South African index trackers, we had commodity trackers, and then the foreign trackers, you know, foreign reference trackers with Deutsche Bank. So within the first seven or eight years, we more or less established the uh, the structure for the ETF industry as it looks today. Yeah, and then I mean, the, the big one, one was then it was around 2008 or so. I remember me and you did a couple of road trips. I was at Standard Bank at that point. Um, and I forget if it was the RAFI or perhaps it was the Divi um, for one of those, where, where we started to start getting sort of thematic, uh, in a sense, almost smart uh, uh, beta sort of ETS, which has become a, a fair bit of a trend more recently, particularly with uh, core shares. But back then was a, another fairly significant innovation coming to our market. Yes, that was something Cetrix did. Uh, we uh, we listed what we call the smart ETF. We hadn't thought of the idea of smart beta, which is what you call these smart ETFs, the smart beta. And we said instead of listing an index, which is just based on science, market cap, mm -hmm. let's list an index where you go and select a portfolio of shares, which give you a certain type of performance. And uh, the Cetrix Divi was just shares that were going to pay high dividends, the forecasted high dividends. So you're buying high dividend paying shares, and that gave you a a certain premium. And so Satrix Divi was the first so-called smart beta ETF. And within a year, we brought in the RAFI and uh, New Gold uh, or New Funds, APSA brought in their e mm -hmm. which is where you use the black box to go and select which companies were undervalued. So you were really bringing in value ETFs. Now, the problem with smart beta is it hasn't worked all that well in South Africa because our market's too small to really yeah. give you a wide choice. So we've got 15 different smart beta ETFs in South Africa, and they're only about 4 billion rand. So it's 4% of the industry. And I'd like to see that smart beta industry growing going forward because there's some very innovative product there. But when you buy smart beta, you're really buying a value strategy. And South Africa is a growth market. It's a momentum market. It's not a value market. Just ask any active manager who hasn't managed to beat the index for the last 20 years. We're not a value-driven market. But we can become value-driven market, and that happens from time to time when you get a bull market value suddenly unlocks itself, you know, shares that are undervalued suddenly perform well. And that's what smart beta is there, is to try and capture that. So the fact that we've got a lot of smart beta, 15 different smart beta products in place in the industry at the moment, I think will drive interest in that area. But it's been quite disappointing at the moment. And there's some very innovative stuff there <laughs> in that smart beta space, but uh, there hasn't been a lot of uh, acceptance by the investment public. Yeah, I certainly agree with you. I think there's, there's some great products that have come out in the, in the space, but the investors haven't flocked to them. We, we talk, you talk around the assets under, under management. It was doubling. It slowed. Um, what's it about? I think, it, I think the last report I saw coming out of your offices sitting at around about 120 billion. In one sense, that's a giant number. In the other sense, of course, if you compare this to the active industry, there is a long way for this passive industry, the ETF industry in South Africa, still to go. Yes, it's been a success story in its own way, the ETF industry, and it's grown steadily. There's been no scandals. It hasn't been beset by some of the issues that have affected uh, you know, hedge funds and private equity and various other things and our cyber cryptocurrencies. There always seems to be a funny story around those. ETFs have been good, solid growers. There's never been a scandal. There's never been a failed trade. They're good, solid uh, industry, but it's uh, it's still only the unit trust industry is 2.6 trillion rand, you know, yeah. 2.6 billion rand compared with 100 billion rand. So the unit trust industry, actively managed unit trust industry, is still 26 times the uh, ETF industry. That, that says to me the ETF industry is going to go 26 times in the next uh, 20 years or so. Yeah, you because know, elsewhere in the world, ETFs have overtaken the active unit trust or mutual fund industry. So there's plenty of room in South Africa to grow. But uh, that'll be gradual. 
Uh, in South Africa, investments are sold, and there's this massive distribution team out there. You know, there's financial advisors and salesmen selling yeah. actively managed products, unit trusts, and so on. And that's that's hard to break into. Uh, ETFs don't have the margins to be able to hire a big distribution. They're very low cost, and therefore they just don't have the marketing budgets. Uh, but they're getting well known, and there's uh, there's tremendous scope for growth. But at the moment, you're quite right; the active industry is uh, very dominant in South Africa, and that's almost unique. Elsewhere in the world, ETFs have you know done somewhat better relatively than they have in South Africa. And and one of the trends, because you're right. I mean, in in the US, the, the 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 passive is now bigger than the active. It's it's the same in, in in London. It certainly has grown. One of the trends we have seen in the institutional space is is sort of the some retirement products and and annuity products starting to use uh, uh, ETFs. How big is that? Or is it big, you know it's a case of I'm so close to the ETFs. I see the likes of ETFSA. I see what Outvest is doing and the like. And and I and I think it's booming. But perhaps I'm looking at it through sort of rose-tinted narrow glasses. Yes, we don't have, you know, you can run a retirement fund just using ETFs. There's 100 ETFs covering every asset class you can think of and quite a few asset classes that uh, um, many retirement managers don't use. For instance, you could put 10% of your retirement fund into commodities mm-hmm. since 2011. And if it's B says or if it's C has or no, it says, well, just go and buy an ETF or an ETN if you want to buy a commodity. Yet very few retirement funds do that. Now, those commodity ETFs not only have performed well, but they're contracyclic good. And they've actually helped quite a lot in, 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 in the retirement fund industry. And I think people are now starting to realize that if you want alternative investments, then possibly commodities is the place to look at. So there's plenty of scope to grow further in retirement funds. But uh, what you find uh, globally is that in America, a lot of people in, in the UK and elsewhere run their own retirement fund, 401ks or Mm-hmm. individual RAs, retirement uh, funds. In South Africa, nobody really runs their own retirement fund. You know, to get registered as a retirement fund is a massive problem in terms of registration and carrying capital and compliance and so on. So everybody buys a retirement fund from somebody, uh, you know, an asset manager, a life insurance company or an ETFSA or something like that. So we don't have privately run pension funds in South Africa, and that's what they have internationally. And internationally, people who run their own retirement funds buy ETFs. You know, sometimes they'll just buy an S&P 500, sometimes they'll buy a bond ETF and S&P 500, and if they're really interested, they might buy a China ETF. But they, they run very successful retirement funds just using ETFs, um, and that's individual. So they don't have to be sold that by, uh, by unit trust sales, and yeah. they go and do that themselves, and they get the same tax concessions for running their own retirement funds as a big company can. In South Africa, the retirement business is still run by by asset managers, and they tend to prefer unit trusts and individual shares and things like that. But we've seen some inroads in the uh, ETF space uh, being used in retirement funds, and we've run very successful retirement funds just purely using ETFs and ETFs, and so, so do one or two other people. Uh, so it's uh, it can be done. Yeah, I mean, and, and so you you left Satrix uh, in 2009. You 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 found ETFSA, and and in the South African space, this was sort of the first purely, uh, uh, you know, an old school asset manager in a sense, but purely focused on the passive uh, ETF industry, you know, initially just enabling people to buy across different ETFs on a platform, but moving into retirement annuities, moving into uh, uh, annuities more, more broadly at the same time. Yes, well, living annuities have been a big growth industry for us personally, you know, I think, uh, and uh because uh, a living annuity is not REG 28 compliant, so you can hold a lot of your assets offshore. And if you want to hold offshore assets, without going through massive problems, you can buy those offshore assets using ETFs in South Africa. You can buy foreign reference ETFs on the JSE. So, uh, so that's a big area. We find our big growth areas increasingly people are coming to us and saying, I want you to manage my portfolio, but use ETFs to do it. Mm-hmm. Because there's less and less shares that really add value in a portfolio. And less and less unit trusts, so that add value. You know, a lot of unit trusts underperform an index, so most of them, in fact, 90% of them do. So increasingly, we're finding people are putting together baskets of ETFs and saying, even though I'm using passive building blocks to build a portfolio, multi-manager portfolio of uh, shares of, of, of ETFs, I can actually outperform. I can get alpha performance by just using the right meets of building blocks. And that's the next, next big area of growth. And uh, ETFSA is doing it you know, quite successfully, but we're starting to see other people doing it as well. So I think the, uh, 
it's a it's an area where there can be some growth is that uh, we uh, you know once we've got a hundred plus ETFs on the JSE and it will it will be growing quite a lot going from here all of a sudden you've got all this choice I don't have to go and decide which shares to buy I can just go and buy a, a China ETF or I can go and buy a you know, a Resi ETF, I don't have to decide which mine I want to buy, I can just buy a resources ETF. I can go and buy a bond ETF. How do I invest in bonds without buying a retail savings bond? Well, I buy a bond ETF, which pays me a 9.8% interest, you know. So uh, so we find ETFs are growing in the areas where you can now use them as assets, uh, exposure uh, products to build a proper strategic asset allocation to build a proper multi-managed portfolio and that's uh, that's another big area of growth i think going forward in south africa and uh, but your active managers have to learn some new tricks to do that and uh, i think they're gradually doing that i think they, i mean I, I think they are i mean it's some of them let's be honest, are probably coming in, kicking and screaming. But I mean, Narina did a, a presentation for us. I think it was back in, in April, Narina Fiss, obviously your colleague. And uh, she, she does exactly that. And she does it with ETFSA, where you, 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 you can build sort of any sort of portfolio that you want using JC listed ETFs and ETNs. Um, and you can skew it as, as you want. You can you know adapt to the risk profile of a client or if they're looking for income or if they you know got 20, 30, 40 years and the like. And you can build them as building blocks almost absolutely any way that they particularly want. Pretty much so. And of course, ETFs are very liquid, so you can get out of them in five minutes if you want to. So, uh, yeah, we can go through our whole portfolios, you know, the hundreds of portfolios we run and say we just don't like being in property. And we can sell every single property ETF from the portfolio in five minutes. You know, we've got yeah. the software to be able to do that. Now, that's much more difficult when you've got an active portfolio. How do you go and sell? 20 different property shares that you own and is there enough market there can you find uh, people who are going to buy it without driving the price down but in ETF you've got a market maker and he'll give you a price at NAV so you don't affect the price in the market so ETFs allow you to get in and out into asset classes very quickly if necessary um, and that's that's very important and I think that's something that's also people are just starting to learn now is, that, is you can change your your strategy very quickly if necessary um, by buying something that doesn't have price risk. Yeah, and that's an ETF great point. Is the index. There's yeah, no you, price risk, you know, you're buying the index. You, and you've got the liquidity. You know, ETFs, we typically, we focus on the basket nature, we focus on the fees, um, but the liquidity is is, is hugely important. I, I can liquidate my entire portfolio at five past nine tomorrow morning. I'm not going to take a price risk there because there will be liquidity. If we if we look forward for we, we, we're Correct. 20 years into to ETFs in South Africa. If we look forward the next 10 or 20 years, when probably me and you will be will be you know sipping cocktails at, at, at the beach with the game reserve. Um, one of the you mentioned at the the, the medium term budget policy statement around inward listing. I, I was chatting with with uh, uh, the JSC on my show a few weeks ago. The possibility to put dollar denominated product on the JSC. Is the growth in the next couple of years going to be around probably more than anything offshore uh, products onto ETFs in South Africa and perhaps even dollar denominated uh, ETFs on, onto the JSC? Yes, Simon, the 70% uh, of the market cap of all the ETFs on the JSC is foreign reference, either commodities or mm -hmm. you know, foreign ETFs trading on the JSC that are equities, bonds, whatever have you. So really 70% of the market is that. Now you've had the inward investment uh, lifting of those restrictions, which now means you can bring in ETFs globally and list them on the JSC in any sort of number. And there's you know there's 6,000 ETFs worldwide and we've only got a very small selection of the types of ETFs that could be brought into the JSC. So I see that being a great big area of growth. And I think the next step, yes, if you're allowing you know, people to bring in foreign reference ETFs in dollars and then trading them in rands. Why don't you just trade them in dollars? Yeah. So uh, I think when the Reserve Bank gets some confidence, uh, I think that's what we'll see. So we'll probably see dollar trading on the JSC, but probably initially in those big inward listed companies. In other words, companies which are secondary listed in the JSC, but have a major listing offshore. So the risk is not um, you're buying those products, you know, for a primary market. You're not, you're not having to run that whole
Yeah, uh, did we lose you there for a moment? Nope, there we go. Um, and, and then uh, the, the other thing, in the US, we see a lot of the sort of synthetic ETFs. And, and by this, I'm referencing uh, the, the the ones that are, are inverse ETFs. So they go down when markets go up or the other way around. The ones that offer gearing, et cetera. And there's been some challenges around them. There's been a couple of them that have blown up. I, a lot of people are asking me about them from time to time. I'm not sure I particularly like them, but is that something we which might in time also come to the JSC, or is your sense that perhaps we really don't need to, to add any sort of gunpowder to an ETF? Ah, we have lost Mike. Let me quickly see. It looks very much like uh, no, Mike is having internet problems. Let me give him a, a quick moment to come back on. We, we got some questions coming through. Uh, Stamen, you're asking how old are ETNs? Um, so ETNs mostly were were driven by the commodities and the commodity uh, listings, and initially those were ETFs. And as Mike said, back in 2004 with ABSA and then the, the, the new gold, and they bought platinum in and the like. And then what we started to see was was ETNs coming in, uh, and it was around about and I remember chatting with uh, the ABSA team back then in, in 2010 as they were looking to bring uh, exchange traded notes into the market um, and we saw a couple and then they sort of started getting significantly bigger in terms of the the presence of, of exchange traded notes um, and Billy uh, your question difference between uh, ETFs ETPs and ETNs and it's you know it, it's phrases we use interchangeably so ETPs is exchange traded products and so that's the sort of umbrella in a sense which which holds them all together your etf which is your satrix 40 and the like uh, and the key point of an etf is that they physically hold that underlying in other words if you've got the satrix 40 they go and buy the shares if you've got new gold they go and buy those bars of gold so they physically hold them an etn is pretty much like a credit note and what that means is that you're sitting in a situation where the the etn is promising you the return it doesn't necessarily hold the underlying asset now they then generate that return by derivatives or the like um, and it does bring a, a layer of risk because if there's a default by the issuer then you're part of the of the process if there's a default by an etf well, they can't default because they have the shares. They physically got them. There's absolutely uh, no problem with them in, in, in that sense there. Um, what we also see is then the question is why use ETNs? And sometimes this is practical. And I give you the example, you know, an ounce of gold fits in my hand uh, and it is worth, I mean, what's an ounce of gold these days? I'm quickly trying to do the math. Let's call it 35,000 and, and it sits in my hand. Um, but an ounce of silver, which is worth, you know, 300, takes the same amount of space. So it's around that storage and the, and those sort of challenges. That's why oftentimes they're, they're using uh, ETNs rather than than an ETF. Of course, an ETN cannot be included in a tax-free account. Mike, have we got you back online? No, still struggling there. We'll drop a, a message. We'll, we'll keep on fighting that fight for a couple more minutes. Uh, but if you've got questions, drop them in. Adam, data showing impact on tax-free on the ETF market. So, Adam, oddly enough, I mean, it, 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 it's something which I've tried to, to compute. Now, in the one sense, certainly we know that there's been a lot of tax-free accounts that have been opened. Um, and, and the data supports that. And obviously, those are either going to be Unitrust, ETF, or cash accounts, no individual shares in, 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 that, in, in that there. Um, direct data to say that it's boosted it, I, I, I couldn't find the research. What I can find is, is certainly anecdotal. A, a lot of people who, who perhaps would have been you know, share investors now put at least some money into the, the ETF space every year because of that, that tax benefit. Um, but I think a lot of people as well who had ETFs have sort of moved those purchases into the tax-free environment. Um, what I think tax-free has perhaps done more than boost the industry, and it was one of the questions I had for Mark, but more than boost the industry, I think it's, it's made it more sticky in a sense. Whereas in the past, perhaps you had some money in an ETF and then something happened, so you quickly popped off. Um, now it's the case of, of really it's, it's a sense of uh, you're going to leave them in there because you want that, that tax-free advantage. 
Uh, so uh, Mike is not going to be able to rejoin us. The technology has overwhelmed him at the uh, King Sharker Airport. But we got we got uh, a good chunky 30 minutes out of him. We got some good information there. Um, folks, I'm not seeing any more questions coming through. So I'm going to uh, park that. If you've got a couple, you can drop them in quick. Remember, two weeks time, we've got the final power hour for the year, uh, 3rd of December. That is going to be presented by me. And that is the, as it always is, position your portfolio for 2021. Uh, first, I review my comments from what I said a year ago at the JSC when we were young, uh, naive, ignorant, and completely unexpecting of a pandemic. And then I'll try and get a sense of what I think is going to be happening in 2021. Invites for that, we're going out shortly. It is again, of course, going to be a, uh, 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 online only. Uh, we'll be back physically one day recently. Uh, Gideon, the government has recently changed Reg 28. We can now invest 100% offshore. So Gideon, yes and no. So remember, there's different parts of the government. And I know that there are some commentators out there who have said that this has happened and that they have legal opinion that says it is absolutely so. Um, but at this point, all they have is, is legal opinion. Um, and the FSCA has put out a note that very clearly states uh, you know, the, 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 they, they recognize what's happened at, at, at Saab, but no, at this point in time, as we stand here on 19 November, you still got all those Reg 28s. I think it's probably going to happen, just there's a process. I was chatting uh, uh, with Vaudine Reddy at the JSC a few weeks ago on my show, and she said it's probably going to start, you know, sort of mid to late uh, Q1 of next year. So what's that? February, March we'll start to see that start happening. And the theory being is that because they will be totally enrolled listed, you could, your equity component in a, in a Reg 28, which is your pension, provident, retirement, and the like, um, that 78, 75%, which is capped at 30% offshore, you could put all 75% into a S&P 500 ETF um, and, and, and therefore get full offshore. Uh, Sheila, absolute pleasure. Um, how can investors be certain that the ETF TERS are true? Are the TERS regulated by the FSCA or another body? So that's a great question too, total expense ratio. Um, so how we know it's true is that every the, the ETF issuers on their sense announcements publish annual financial results around their business. And we can calculate from that. We can also see it coming out of the, the dividends. Um, but there is there is oversight in the sense that they literally uh, publish their, their results. Some do it uh, biannual. Some do it on an annualized basis. But go to your favorite ETF. Look back on the sense announcements. And you will see the results for the ETF. Um, in some cases, they do it for the individual ETF. Sometimes they do it for the entire business. So we can see what is happening. Uh, Snowman, can I invest offshore via an ETN? Um, I don't know if there are any ETNs. In fact, I think there are. But I think so. For example, I'm trying to think if there are any ETNs referencing offshore markets. I don't know if there are. Certainly, no, no reason why not to. I mean, they've mostly focused around the commodity space and the like. But there's nothing stopping a, a issuer. From, from doing it into in, in, into into uh, offshore. Deutsche Bank used to have a couple. Their China one, they had a BRICS, um, and then they had a Africa. Uh, Standard Bank also had an Africa uh, uh, ETN. Um, those have all been delisted over the last couple of years, but no reason why not. Uh, Billy, absolute pleasure. I, I agree with you. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Mike Brown, and look stressed, no relation. Hey? Lots of Browns in the world. I mean, he really is the father of ETFs, and I know that's a cliche, but it is true. And it, it, it's it's even more fascinating because he started at the Chamber of Mines. I mean, he was in the thick of, of, of the gold mining industry. Um, ladies and gents, we shall leave that there. We're not going to be able to get Mike back on, but as we were, we were winding down anyway. Uh, huge thanks to the JC team for helping us this evening. Uh, as I said, we'll be back again in two weeks. Uh, everyone stay safe. The video will be up. A couple of folks asking for video. It will be up on justonelap.com. Uh, that will be live later this evening. And then ETFSA will also add it onto their website, no doubt. I will send them that link. Everyone, appreciate your time. Have a great evening further. Stay safe. Cheers all.